There was one kid who was the best little league player I ever saw. Man, he was something else, you know, but he was bigger than everybody else. And when he got to high school, he couldn't make the team. Like, <laughs> what happened to him? He was such a good player. What happened to him? And the answer was nothing happened to him. The game sped up, but he didn't. He was still trying to do the things he did when he was successful. So I think every ball player will eventually face the fact that they got to leave the game, right? Even if you get, otherwise we'd all be in the Hall of Fame. The game speeds up and it outpaces your talent. Um, and so my point is, is that somebody that's going in from, um, from Babe Ruth up to Little League, uh, excuse me, high, high school, JV, the game speeds up. The, the talent pool narrows. It's, the, the ball is starting to move faster. And so if you have a, a swing that was working for you at one point and is no longer working, well, you, need, you might need to change. The problem is with most hitters in baseball, they don't change. You're listening to the Just Sayin' Podcast, offering conversations with experts that will educate, inform, and entertain. Here's your host of the Just Sayin' Podcast, Charlie Cornaccio. The Just Sayin' Podcast is brought to you by New Leaf Hypnosis Center. At New Leaf, you'll be working with mindset coach and hypnotist Anthony Serino to overcome mental roadblocks holding you back from achieving your goals. Using a science-based and client-centered approach, Anthony will help you design the life you deserve. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Just Saying Podcast. Looks like we're going to have a baseball season after all, although it will be a shortened season for Major League Baseball. And it also looks like youth baseball leagues around the area are getting back on the fields. So perfect timing for today's guest, Kevin Gallagher who has a new book out that will help all of you parents out there to help your child to have measurable success in the batter's box. Kevin Gallagher was a three-year captain of the baseball team at Pace University. He was the first player at the school to reach 100 career hits, a three-time ECAC All-Star Pace Athlete of the Year in 73 and 74, He was the winner of the Pace University President's Trophy in 1975 for both his academic and athletic accomplishments. Kevin also set six all-time career records, most bats, most at-bats, runs scored, hits, triples, extra base hits, stolen bases, and is still in the top 10 record books for triples and stolen bases. So he came out with this book for parents, and it's a, a way to teach their kids to hit. It's a multimedia presentation. It's a book. It's an ebook with illustrations in the book and links to actual video instruction. So Kevin Gallagher joins us. And Kevin, how are you these days? Good, Charlie. Thank you. Nice introduction. Thank you. Well, let's talk about uh, your your career first. Um, you know, before we get into the the book, you, you played some college, as we spoke. But you played some minor league ball, but then your career ended prematurely. What happened? Well, Charlie, uh, uh, back then I was heavily scouted by a lot of teams, and some of the guys you might remember. Herb Stein was a scout with the Twins. He signed Rod Carew. My guy was was Ralph Delulo. He was the head scout uh, for the the Cubs, a legendary scout. Um, uh, he signed a lot of players, Joe Necro, Bruce Sue, and people like that. Anyway, he was also the head of the Major League Scouting Bureau back then, which was just beginning. It's a computerized system. Before that, everyone kept their own database and their, their notebooks about who's who. No, nobody shared nothing. But now everything was being shared in there. I bring that up because over my senior year, he called me several times. He said, just stay healthy. I'll, I'll draft you. No, just stay healthy. Well, I didn't stay healthy. Right, The last two weeks of the season, I, I hurt myself. And so he pulled me out of the database and said, listen, I'll bring you over to the Metropolitan League over in Jersey. You might know that. Yep. And uh, well, we have you now sign you. Well, as it turned out, the injury I had was more severe. It was a broken wrist. Um, so it didn't happen there. So over the winter, I got contacted by 14 teams. Eight of them brought me to kiss, invited me to camp. And I went down to uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, the, it was one of the first invites. It was a spring, tra- um, a strike year that year, Charlie. And so spring training was shortened, et cetera, et cetera. So I was in the uh, plane. They had five, six free agents in camp. They released five. I, I stayed. I became the second baseman leading off playing for the Class A uh, Pittsburgh Pirates on Bradenton. And um, it was during that game I got hurt. I left the game in the fifth inning, and I, I never walked onto a field again. I, I, the injury that ended my career was a torn rotator cuff and torn um, separated shoulder. And back then, that was a death knell. Today, you can get them fixed and want them yeah, to back then. Right. So that was it. I never stepped foot in the field again. Uh, so. Yeah. So you, you played in the 70s. You coached for a while. Why did it take you so long to write this book? Well, I'll get personal with you. <laughs> when I came home, I was quite bitter about it, right? Um, I just always thought I'd be a ball player. That's just the way it was. You know, I was on the way up. Never really faced any adversity. Um, 
So when that happened, I came home. I was I was very bitter and angry internally, and um, kind of lost. I got involved in uh, family business in Croton. Had a, a restaurant and bar called Gallagher's Two. Very successful business, and it was it was wonderful. I did that for many years. But as time went by, um, you know, I developed a drinking problem. I went to a dark place, and um, this uh, loss of my career was the genesis of that. And today I'm sober 29 years, and I help others that, that have the same type of problem. But that's what happened after I came home. And um, I later got involved with, um, which I do now for the last uh, almost 30 years, I'm involved in high-tech sales to uh, large international firms, and I'm involved with that. But, um, but that's what I did after I came home. Rico Petroselli endorses this book, as well as uh, Rick Wolf from WFAN, who actually wrote the foreword to the book. How did these endorsements come to be? Rico, let's just start with Rick. Rick, I've known him a long time from my playing days. Um, he's been in my soul a long time. And I'm going to tell you, one day my brother said something to me. He said to me, Kevin, you know, um, I would give my right arm to have been you for one day. One, just get one headline, one home run, you know, one pat in the back, one, one MVP, whatever. It might be. See, I, I got none of those. And you're not enjoying one single one of them, you know. I still carry around the bitterness of not having that career turn out. And he was right. You know, I heard him. A guy like my brother was a good athlete later on, but as a youngster, he wasn't. He was always the last guy on the bench, didn't make the team, he didn't grow up fast enough, you know. Eventually he was, but no one ever taught him how to play. And it became clear to me that there's many ordinary kids out there that don't get the chance to experience baseball, right, and all that goes along with it. So it can have a profound impact on their self-esteem, who their friends become, who they hang out with. Do they take a whisk on the next venture? Are they good enough? So I wanted to write a book to them uh, and to the parents so that they could teach them and, uh, you know, for the ordinary kid. So like, there's plenty of videos out there and on YouTube and very complicated approaches to hitting for the exceptional athlete. But the ordinary kid that wants to play ball for a few years and doesn't get a chance because he doesn't know how, that's, that's why I wrote the book. And to go one step further with that, Charlie, is after I wrote the book, it became even more evident to me when I started to get responses to my book. And the one that came first was profound. It said to me very simply, it was a guy from Valhalla. And he said to me, thank you, Kevin. I, I am that kid. He didn't say I was that kid. He's 64 years old now. He says, I am that kid. He remembers vividly the shame, the embarrassment, you know, the, the ostracization. He couldn't hang out with certain guys. He wasn't cool. All that because he couldn't hit a baseball. And no one ever taught him how. And he stayed, this stayed with him for 55 years, you know? Yeah. And so, like, there's a lot of kids out there today silently crying out, well, I, I want to play this game. Will somebody please teach me, you know? Yeah. That, that's why I wrote the book. So back to uh, your other questions about Rick and Rico. Um, I know Rick for a long time. And when I finished writing this book, I didn't know. I've never been an author. Sometimes you doubt yourself. I picked up the phone. I called Rick. I haven't talked to him in, in you know, maybe uh, 10 years. And I said, Rick, I wrote a book. Would you take a look at it? And uh, he said, sure, send it over. So I sent it to him. It was just a manuscript. No, dial no um, illustrations, no pictures, no videos. He read the book and came back to me and said, Kid, I love it. I absolutely love the book. You're onto something here. And it gave me a lot of um, encouragement. So that was the first thing. And he started pointing me in the right direction as far as illustrators. And he said, and he gave me the, one of the best advice. He said, Rick, why don't you put the name on the book with me? Maybe we'll you know, get too fast to the publication. And he said, no, Kevin, this is your book. And you're going to do all the work. And I'll point you in the right direction. But when you're done and you get that author's copy in your hand, you're going to be, it's going to be the best day of your life. And he was right. <laughs> Um, so then I, I, uh, Rico happens to be, uh, comes down here to uh, Fort Myers for spring training with the Red Sox and, um, his nephew lives next door. So I'd see him from time to time. I see him at the ballpark and I pulled him aside one time. I said, Rico, I wrote a book. Would you take a look at it? Four hours later, he called me back because I read the book twice. I loved the book. <laughs> so he, both of those, they both decided to endorse it and write the forward for me. And, um, you know, it was good. So that's how that came about. Oh, nice. Really nice. Uh, you know, it's funny how those things happen that you were living right next door to a relative you get able to meet him. Uh, you knew, you knew Rick already. Uh, it's almost like when those things happen, you know that something's supposed to positively happen uh, in, in your path. When things are going right for you like that, yeah, everything has gone right with this book. You ever, remember the show Get Smart? And they they, they open up, and Maxwell walk, and all the doors would open. And you just keep walking, you know. Yeah, yeah. That, this book feels that way. Everything has just kind of gone, you know, right up to to this moment, you know, and and uh, how well I'm doing the book sales. So yeah, it, it feels right. Well, um, let's talk. Let's talk about the progression. You you have a, a really good segment in your book about the progression of uh, an athletic kid who might be one of the better players in Little League or Cal Ripken or any youth program, but then he doesn't do as well as he progresses through the ranks of like senior league and JV baseball and varsity baseball. Uh, give us your perspective on that. 
I'm glad you picked it out of the book because it is in there. Um, this book is not just about the kids starting out. It's not at all. It's about anybody along the way when they begin to face failure or, or you know, they're not doing as well as they used to, right? So a lot of kids will start out natural ability, natural talent. Um, they can hit the ball, you know? You have a flawed method. It doesn't matter. You're bigger, you're, fit, you're more athletic, whatever it might be. But then as you go along, the game speeds up and then things happen. I remember there's something in my book I'll refer to. There was a, particularly in my life, it was one kid. It was the best little league player I ever saw. Man, he was something else, you know, but he was bigger than everybody else. And when he got to high school, he couldn't make the team. Like, <laughs> what happened to him? He was such a good player. What, what happened to him? And the answer was nothing happened to him. The game sped up, but he didn't. He was still trying to do the things he did when he was successful. So I think every ball player will eventually face the fact that they got to leave the game, right? Even if you get, otherwise we'd all be in the Hall of Fame. The game speeds up and it outpaces your talent. Um, and so my point is, is that somebody that's going in from, um, from Babe Ruth up to Little League, uh, excuse me, high, high school, JV, the game speeds up. The, the talent pool narrows. It's, the, the ball is starting to move faster. And so if you have a, a swing that was working for you at one point and is no longer working, well, you, need, you might need to change. The problem is with most hitters in baseball, they don't change. They just figure, well, I was successful for the, these past number of weeks, months, years. It's going to stop being successful again. They never look to change. And uh, this contact hitting, which is the top hand hitting that I teach for youngsters just starting out, is also the, the direction that can extend one's career when they face difficulties as they move up the ranks in, 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 the, in, in, in baseball. And so um, the method that works with the new newcomer, uh, uh, Rick um, Wolf, we'll talk about in the forward to my book. He learned this method in the Atlantic Collegiate Baseball League between his sophomore and junior years in college. His, his, his coach at the time, uh, Al Goldstein, when they later become a super scout for the Angels, told them, Rick, you're not going to make it in the, in the pros. It's gonna, the ball's going to be traveling 92, 95. Down here, it's 88. Your long swing is not going to get there. You had that looping swing. So he changed his, his um, swing then and wound up going on playing three balls, three years of ball in the Detroit organization. So you're right. This top hand hitting approach that I teach um, works for anybody when their style stops working. Let's talk about uh, parents who played at, at a high level maybe scholarship level uh, and feel, you know, they, they had some great success in their own careers and they know what's best for their kids. What should they know about this book? Well, it's a delicate subject because when people are good athletes, they think they know a lot about the game, right? And they do. And they know a lot about hitting. They could talk to you about a slider and seeing the break. They can talk to you about a lot of things, but when it comes down to trying to teach someone to hit a baseball, it's a, it's one of the most difficult things to do in sport, right? Yeah. Yep. Um, and if you're that good at it, chances are no one taught you. you. You just knew instinctively how to do it. No one taught me how to hit. I just instinctively knew how to do it and worked on it and refined it, whatever. But the point was is, is that if you're really that good at it, it's hard to convey to someone else to just do what you did. So you need a process and a blueprint. You try, you look in the major leagues, who, you, who, you, who are your managers, who are your coaches, right? They're, they're not the, the old, they're not Willie Mays. It's not Hank Aaron. It's not the, you no, know, it's not the best players. It's the guys that have talent, but have work at it and refine it and get a process and do it over and over and over to maximize their talent. So when it comes time to teaching someone, players like that can go back and teach someone starting out because they have a process and a blueprint. If you do this and this and this, this will happen and you can lead them along the way. But players um, that were very good don't always have that, um, that, that blueprint. They just know how to do it. And it's hard to tell someone to just do what you did. And I refer to it in the book, too. It's like when you try to teach your kid to drive or, or if you were a kid and your parent was trying to teach you to drive. It's very difficult because you're trying to teach them to do things that you just do. You know, you, you know how to look in the rearview mirror. You know how to watch out for the other guy. It's, it's, it's an instincts that you have that come to you and you don't have a blueprint. That's why they have driver's ed and that's why they have driving instructors. You know, there's no emotion involved and they can tell them what to do. So, yeah, it's, I would tell them to keep an open mind that they may know a lot more about the game than everybody when it comes to hitting, um, they may know less because they don't have a process to teach. Interesting uh, other point that you make in the book, and you illustrate this, and I think we all know this, but uh, you, you verbalize it just beautifully, and that's that baseball is the only game that stops for you. So the game's going on, but then it stops when you're up at bat, and then everybody's looking at you. And you could play other sports, lacrosse, or whatever, team sports like that, where you could kind of fly under the radar, get the success of the team of a goal or a stop or whatever. But in baseball, it's you. And everyone's, it, the defense, the spectators, your, your teammates, they're all eyes are on you. And if you don't have success, especially as a young kid, you strike out or whatever, 
you have to, you have that walk of shame back to the dugout. How many times will a kid endure that before they say, you know what, um, I guess so many other things that I could be doing where I'm happy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not only that, not just being happy, it's embarrassing, right? I mean, um, that's why we have a responsibility to teach our kids to hit so they don't quit because they will quit, right? Um, no matter how much you love the sport, you want them to play. If they're not going to stand up there if they don't know how to hit and swing a miss and swing a miss and swing a miss and take that long walk back to the, you know, with grandma and grandpa and maybe the boy or girl that likes them in the stands, they're not going to do it very often. Eventually, they're going to stop. And uh, like you said, the longest walk is back to the dugout. It's just, it's a lonely walk. You, you're, you're not going to do it very often. So there's plenty of other sports they can play. Well, they can go to the street corner. You know, some kids wind up on a street corner too. You know, um, but you know, so some of the best lacrosse players out there and some of the best soccer players could have been wonderful baseball players too. They're athletic, but they didn't stick around because in baseball, as, we, as you just said, there's plenty of sports where you can run around for two hours as a kid. Nobody knows what the hell happened. He played the sweat and he did good. But in baseball, the game stops four times a game. Here, son, here, here, here young lady, here's a bat. Go stand there. We're all going to watch you now and see if you succeed or fail. And you're not going to do that very, very often. You're, you're going to wind up leaving. So uh, the responsibility is on us to teach them to make contact. And that happens not just when you first start out, but you know, as you move up the, the line a little bit, you were doing fine. Now you're not. Eventually, you're going to leave that game too, whether it's in JV or varsity or wherever it might be when you face adversity. Unless you change the style you had, and this style will work for you, this can prolong careers. Um, you're going to wind up quitting because who's going to subject themselves to that um, embarrassment over and over? Right? Your approach is a top hand approach. Yes. And you have illustrations in the book to drive that point home. Also links to, uh, to YouTube where there's videos that uh, explain it as well in pretty good detail. Why is the top hand approach so successful? Well, once again, on this book, I want to make clear that this book is written to the parent, right? We're not, reading a, we're not writing a book to teach a child how to hit or kids. something. It's written to the parent because I want to empower the parent to be able to teach their child. Most parents think that they, they take them to the ballpark. If it doesn't work out, you know, they, they send them off to the Little League coach or, or the Babe Ruth coach. And the, the, we need those folks. That they have time in their hands. We need them to coach our kids. But um, they may not know how to teach hitting either. Very few people do. So they're not going to get the instruction that they need. So uh, top hand hitting is a, is a method that anybody, when they read this book, watch the video, look at the illustrations, it's an eight step simple process that they're gonna be able to understand and own and be able to take to their child and, and verbalize it to them so that they, are, no kids are not gonna do anything that, that you want them to do unless they understand why, why, why am I doing that? You'll be able to explain to them why. Top hand hitting is all about using the top hand to control the bat, okay? So it's to direct the barrel of the bat where you want it to go. And the top hand hitting, what we talk about is, is chopping a tree. So it's using that top hand so it, it controls the barrel of the bat. And the purpose of that would be to get the barrel of the bat on the same plane of the ball as early as you can for as long as you can to create multiple points of contact along the way. So the ball's coming in on one line. We're talking fastballs here. Early in, in your careers, that's mainly what you're going to see. It's coming in on one line. If you get your bat on the same line early, you, chances are you're going to hit the ball somewhere. And in the beginning for a kid, just hitting the ball somewhere is enough to want to want them to make them come back tomorrow, right? Ground ball to first, a bloop to second, an error at shortstop. They don't, just get on base, be part of the game. So the top hand is, is the key uh, conductor of where that barrel goes. And I know we talk about the launch angle too, which is being taught today and has revolutionized the game, Charlie. Um, but it's a very difficult uh, task to do. Even the major leaguers will strike out 200 times to hit 30 home runs, right? And, and to correlate to uh, Hank Garen and Willie Mays, they struck out 66 times a season and they, they average 37 home runs a game. So they were contact hitters and home run hitters. Today, it's, either, it's all or nothing. It's, it's the launch angle, it's, it's a home run or, or a swing and miss. And um, so the, the launch angle takes the top hand and makes it the bottom hand. The barrel of the bat always follows the top hand, goes down below, below the passive ball, and has to get back up to where that, that ball is, and there's only one intersection point. And if you don't get there, you're going to miss it. And uh, it creates, you need perfect timing. And if the major leaguers have trouble doing that, believe me, your kid's going to have trouble doing that. Yeah, right. The game itself has, you know, over the years, it's gone through changes and revolutions and it's come back to, to basics. But there was a point where uh, the home run ball was the big part of the game. That was where most teams were trying to get big hitters uh, to hit those home runs. And that's what they relied on. And small ball took a back seat, except for a few teams yeah. that really started, that really emphasized that and stuck with the small ball approach. And you can manufacture a lot more runs and have more control of the game with small ball. Top hand hitting, does it lend itself to small ball or does it lend itself to 
big home runs. Well, here's the deal. People think that um, top hand hitting and small ball contact, and you don't you don't hit for power. You know, um, last year Jeff McNeil for the Mets, I think he was fourth in batting, which is okay. He had 23 home runs. Uh, Joey Votto had 30 home runs. He's, you know, all these guys are contact type hitters, so you can right. But uh, but small ball is, is all about contact hitting, put, putting the ball in play. But you don't have to give up power. But the launch angle is all about one thing: getting the ball in the air. Yep. Okay. Right. That's all it's about. And, uh, and I credit or, or discredit the launch angle for doing a number of things. It's hurt the game of baseball in some ways. Um, the, 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 uh, the home runs are up, but strikeouts are up, and attendance is down. And Pete Rose said that. He said, I didn't go to Harvard, but that's not a good thing, he said. Yeah. But, you know, there's a couple of things that, right, you, would, you might not realize this, but today in baseball, there's three minutes and 41 seconds between a ball put in play. It's a long time for a kid who hasn't started playing the game yet or isn't invested in the game to sit and watch a ball game. It's kind of boring. Games are taking three and a half hours. You know, they're ending, they're ending late. 34% of all um, at-bats in the game is between the pitcher and catcher. Yeah. So 34% of the game is either a ball, a strike, a home run, or a walk. So, so it's really slowed the game down. And for kids, there's, there's a declining participation of our America's youth today for a lot of reasons. And part of the games are boring to watch. They, go, they end late. There's not a lot of action. For me and you, we know that it's the science of the game and the chess moves. But someone just starting out, then they go to the ballpark, and they're swinging and missing. They're not invested. They're not going to stick around long because they don't love the game because they're not watching it. Right. I think the launch angle <laughs> between me and you, it's fun to see a guy hit a home run. But it slowed the game down to a crawl. And um, a lot of our youth are looking elsewhere for their action. Yeah, and that's uh, a big part of it, too, because, uh, you know, kids, I, I believe, are in the society of, or thought process of immediate gratification. And that's why, you know, video games are so popular yeah. and kids aren't going out and playing on the street like we did when we were kids. So they've got to have that gratification. And like you said, um, you know, three minutes, 41 seconds, that's a long time before something else happens, yeah. especially for a kid with a short attention span these days. And so top hands hitting, contact hitting, small ball, it's putting the ball in play. It's, it's moving. Things are going on. You know, there's a lot more. So uh, I, I think that my, my opinion, Major League Baseball needs to pay attention to that because 10, 20 years from now, when these kids aren't watching, you know, and you and I may be gone, um, where's the fan base, you know? Yeah. Give us the top three things you think parents can do to help their kids in this effort. You know, when you're teaching kids baseball or hitting, you're raising your child. It's just another part of raising a child, you know, whether you send them to school, whatever. Number one, always encourage your child. Always. Don't be, don't, don't be critical. You know, yeah, geez, how many times I got to tell you to keep your eye on the ball? You know, watch how you talk to them. Encourage them. They're supposed to be having fun. It's a game, right? So I would always encourage them to make sure they're having fun, whether they're doing well or not, be encouraging. Number two, I, I would always explain to them what you're asking them to do and why, okay? They need to understand what you're trying to do. So if you're trying to teach them to do something, vague advice is not going to work. You know, staying closer to the plate, don't swing so hard. You know, okay, why? They'll do it, but if they hit the ball, they want to know exactly what they did to replicate it the next time. So you need to explain to them what it is that you're trying to do and why. And in my book, that's before every step I say that. Tell your child what you're going to do and why. Tell them. So they'll understand, don't underestimate their intellect, because if they understand what they're trying to do, oh, that makes sense. They'll buy in and they'll do it. That's my view of it. And then three, you know, I, I really don't want parents to mix up what their view of success is compared to what a kid's view of success is, particularly starting out. You know, a parent wants, always wants to see their kid get a home run, win the game, get a base hit, whatever. But in the beginning, and maybe they're not um, that, you know, versed at the game yet, you know, their, their view of success could just be hitting the ground ball to short and having a guy make an error getting on first base. They're happy as hell, you know, sliding mm -hmm. into second, getting dirty. You know, the view from second base is a view, a view, a magnificent view that nobody sees when they're behind that the, the fence here, you know. And to be out there and be part of something, that, that's, and go to school tomorrow, talk with the, the kids about the game, being part of it, it builds their self-esteem. It builds their, te their teammates and the teamwork and camaraderie. They could be hitting zero, zero, zero. You know, but they could be they could be happy. So I, I want I would want my kid maybe not to be the best one out there. I'd like them to be the happiest. So I'd always encourage them, make sure they're having fun, and explain to them what and why um, you ask them to do what they do. I've covered a lot of youth ball and uh, high school ball and college ball, but um, parents can be brutal on their kids, and I think a big part of that is because there's uh, such an emphasis right now on trying to get a scholarship yeah. to help pay for college. Yeah. And there are scholarships out there. And so parents are really pressing their kids because they know the end result is I'm going to get some help with your college. Right. And sometimes you can burn a kid out that way. 
Absolutely, Charlie. Yep. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. You know, you got to you gotta watch your view of success with the kids' view of success. And, then, and driving them too hard, driving them too hard. It, it's supposed to, you go to the dictionary, baseball's a game. You look up game, it says so, it's something you do to have fun. And, uh, you know, you got to make sure they're still having fun. All right. So uh, I got my copy. You can see <laughs> I beat it up pretty good. It. I beat it up pretty good, but there's so many good things in here uh, and, and illustrations. And I think really what helps is when you then take it from here and, and actually show it in, in YouTube. A lot of people are visual learners, and I think that that's a really good, a good aspect to this. How long did it take you to write? It took me 12 months to write the book, Charlie, and then I found out the work began after that. Yeah, <laughs> right, yeah. With an illustrator in London and getting all, and getting all those illustrations done. I, 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 I created that fellow there called Riley Dude, and I told that illustrator what I wanted. And I said, I want that kid to be not too athletic. I want him to be uh, um, determined. I want him to be kind. I need a kind kid in there. His eyes got to be I, I really, really, this guy took 20, 20 chances, and one day I said, that's it. <laughs> it took a long time to get that, and um, he wasn't a baseball player, so he didn't understand the swing. But we got through it, and bringing the book to uh, it took about six months to get the book from there. So about eighteen months to write the whole book and get it out the door. Well, you're speaking to us from Florida. We want to thank you for giving us some of your time. How are things in Florida these days? It's hot. Don't let nobody tell you it's not. Uh, summertime is hot down here, but as far as the COVID, it's uh, not good. It's um, you know, numbers are going up. I'm here to judge anybody, but uh, people aren't paying attention, you know. So. Um, yeah, it's not so good down here, but uh, yeah. it's a beautiful place. And one, one day, you know, one day, one day closer, Charlie. Yep, that's one day closer. You got to look at it that way. Every day is one day closer. Um, do you ever get out to hit yourself, like go to a batting cage somewhere on the road and uh, just try and hit the ball around? Every now and then, Charlie, if I see a cage, I, I'm I'm drawn to it. You know, I, I, <laughs> I say, if I'm with my wife, just give me give me five minutes. You know. And everyone, is there something about hitting a baseball? You know, you, know, you hit the ball, a round ball, a round bat squarely. It's like you don't even feel it, but it feels wonderful. You know? I know. There was a place in, uh, in Delaware that I used to go to. Um, I forgot the name of it. Uh, but it was the, – what I loved about it was, you know, they had the cages. And it was kind of semicircle with the machines down below throwing up at you. And then beyond it was about maybe 100 or 150, 200 feet, where once you hit it, you got to feel and see how the ball went, you know, the trajectory of it, rather than in a cage where, you know, it's just hitting yeah, the, yeah, the netting. Yeah. That was so satisfying. I, I thought that was a really smart move on the guy's part to create a, a, a batting facility like that. Yeah, so you actually, you know, it would be almost like if you're in a driving range, you know, in a golf. And just hit right. The, you need to see how it went, where it went. Feel, and when you hit good, it feels good. You, yeah, you watch it like it's a, a yeah. yeah, it's always on the 18th hole. <laughs> brings you back, back next week. Yeah. <laughs> kevin gallagher thank you so much uh, for coming on the just saying podcast teach your kids to hit so they don't quit it's a it's a great book it's an easy read with illustrations and as we said video to go along with it so and just one other thing Charlie, the book is a story too there's a story in it there's anecdotes there's, 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 you know it's, it's an interesting story you know as you go through in the back is is the uh, is the instruction but we all it all leads to the inevitable conclusion that the kid don't make contact he's not going to stay with, with the game right uh, like I, we haven't said it yet but it's available on amazon um charlie um that's where we sell it today uh, for a while it'll be, it'll be on barnes and noble soon but right now amazon it's also on my website which is hitting simple.com you can buy it there and there's many other things on my website great well kevin thank you so much for writing the book thanks for spending time with us today Good, Charlie. Good to see you. Thanks. All right. You too. Tune in next week to the Just Saying podcast, where we will have part two of the adoption story. This one from a couple who adopted a child from Russia before Russia closed off Americans being able to adopt Russian children. And then also my brother Michael will have his side of my adoption story. All that coming up next week. But for now, stay safe and be kind. We'll see you next time on the Just Saying Podcast. Thanks for tuning in to the Just Saying Podcast. 